So let's start out with some sample videos that were made with Videolicious. All right, now one disclaimer, this is longer than 60 seconds because I was given an experimental version of the app from the app developer because um, he was testing out the idea of should we allow subscription models where someone could pay like five bucks or ten bucks a month and be able to go beyond 60 seconds. He hasn't enabled it as of yet, um, so it's still the, the one minute maximum, but this may come somewhere down the road where you can pay a little bit of money and get longer than a 60 second clip. Um, so I made this one, this is probably two or three minutes long, about a robotics event we did in my classroom uh, using Lego robots. So the idea was I made this mostly for the parents so that they could see what's going on with Lego robotics with their sons and daughters uh, in middle school. So let me see if I can... I had a buzz before with the audio, so I might have to plug and unplug. As Hi everybody, it's Mr. Z, and we're back today taking a look at what our current robotics engineering competitions look like. Now we're going to take a look here at our floor competition. This is where we're doing the line tracker program. You're going to see we have a black and a white line on the floor, and the goal is to just, of course, follow that line. Seems kind of simple, but the students quickly realize that light values range from 0 to 100, the lower numbers being black and the higher numbers being white. So technically, you can have your robot follow this line as long as you do the numbers correctly. We're keeping track of everything on our spreadsheet so we can see what scores the students are receiving. And up on the big screen, they get to take a look at the results as they come in, live in real time. And we do t uh, keep score by using the countdown timer. And we use the time on the clock uh, with a uh, multiplier to get our points for it. So here you're seeing the students have a conversation about what number is just right. You have to find your low number and your high number in order to find the sweet spot, the perfect number to be programming with. And then through collaboration, the students have to figure out what would make the most sense with our lighting conditions to tell our robots what color is black and what color is white. They program them into the LEGO NXT robots that we have and then try them out on the floor. So this is an MST, or also a STEM, STEM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math type of competition, and it's really been a lot of fun. Uh, the next event we're going to be doing does follow along the same idea using that light sensor, but it's going to add on another sensor too, which would be the ultrasonic sensor, and get the robots to stay on a table and not fall off the platform while they are being tested. So that's a quick look at what we're doing right now in our robotics curriculum. I hope you enjoyed this video blog post. And again, this has been Mr. Z. Thanks for watching and have a great day. Teller, my first task was come up with the story. What am I going to actually say? So I didn't write out a word-by-word -word script. I just wrote out the general highlight ideas in a bulleted list. And then once that was accomplished, I realized, okay, so I need a shot of the kids putting it on the line. I want a wide shot that shows the whole class, so you get an idea it's a class-wide event. Then I want some tight shots where you can see that red laser looking between white and black and going back and forth. Then I thought, well, they're learning programming, so I want to show the computer screen, maybe have a couple kids pointing like they're talking about the computer screen. And then that whole idea of a scale of 0 to 100, so on the whiteboard, let's draw something there and have them like talk like they're pointing out the, between the black numbers and the white numbers. So all this as a storyteller, that's the part that was the most time-consuming. The making of that video I did during one plan period, probably like two or three takes because I wasn't happy with you know, how it sounded at, at first. So the tools themselves are not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out how to be a good digital storyteller, and that's the non-technology piece. So that was the workflow. I created it, and then I was essentially just looking at myself in the front-facing camera on the phone, which I'll demonstrate today with, with the iPad. Um, and you look at yourself and you talk. And as you're talking, you then tap on the screen for the next piece of content. So it might be tap on that video clip. Tap on that picture, picture, video, video, picture, video, picture. So you can mix in photos and videos as you're going. So there's really no post-production afterwards where you have to edit everything together. Once you're done talking, the video is complete. It's just a matter of selecting a soundtrack to go along with it, and then it's, it's all already set. So it's definitely a different kind of workflow as compared to, um, has anybody used iMovie before on an iOS device? So with iMovie, it's a little different. You have an open timeline, and you're putting chunks of either photos or videos on the timeline, you can add narration. That's a different creation process, it takes more time. Um, most would say it gives you more features, more, more creative ability to put things the way you want, but it takes time. So Videolicious is the solution for a quick video that looks like it was uh, edited, but it really wasn't. It was just made on the fly. So that's one example there that's a couple minutes long, but I was uh, 
experimenting with that, that test version of the app that goes that lets you go longer than that. Um, another one here, which was more of a theory of why would I flip my class? I wanted to explain to parents that we're not sure, like, you know, is that teacher really teaching because he's not standing in front of the kids and talking the whole period? Like, is he just, you know, what's the teacher's role in a flipped class? So I tried to explain it by making this video, again, using Videolicious. And I gotta plug it in here. One of the common questions that lately I've been getting asked a lot, both in person and through email, which is, why should you flip your class? There's all this buzz about the flipped classroom. After I hit the why, usually the next question is, well, how? How do you flip it? So I'm going to create in this video blog post the answer behind that. First off, why? I think it's because what I have, I call the three E's. Effective, efficient, and engaging. All right, I'll take each one of those one by one. Number one, effective. I can have kids that are absent and then come in the next day and still know what's going on because of the screencast videos that I've made. As you'll see in these video clips I'm going to show you here, my students have, I'm fortunate to have desktop computers in my classroom, but even if I did and I had mobile devices, they would still be able to use these videos and watch whenever they're absent or outside. So the point here I was making too is you can go back and forth between live headshot talking and then some footage, come back to the headshot talking, and then some footage. So it's a great way to explain something without just being a talking head, kind of blending in what's known as B-roll footage. Just like on the news, when you're watching and the newscaster's talking about a story, and then they cut to footage of it, like if they're talking about the house that burned down, you see them talking, then they're talking about the fire truck, and then the smoke billowing, and then they get interview shots. All that stuff that you're seeing is known as B-roll footage. So Videolicious is great to blend that B-roll footage along with your, your speech. Um, when I made this one, it was different. I wanted to be able to speak it all out and then decide later where the pieces go in so you have that flexibility. I, I talked for you know 90 seconds here straight just so I could uh, focus on what I was saying. And then after the fact, I pulled in that 90 second clip and I said, all right, about here, make that shot go. And then wait a couple seconds, now make that shot go. And I did that after the fact. So you don't have to have the pressure of speaking and selecting at the same time. You could do those two things separate. Speak first, and then once that's done, bring that in, and now put in the B-roll shots. So I'll show you the, those two different ways of creating today, um, but I thought that was a better example of what it looks like when you're um, really focused on what you're saying and you don't want to be distracted. So if you're a one-man show or one-person show, you don't have to worry about tapping the screen at just the right time. Um, the rest of them, if you're interested, you can take a look at them. Again, it's a lot of stuff I was doing with Lego Robotics with the students. Um, and it was, it really did serve well as a way to keep the parents informed because if I didn't make that, there's really not much chance during the day I could get parents to come in and see what we were doing or try to write that in a monthly newsletter, you know, and read that. It's just hard for a parent to understand what Lego robotic programming was all about if they themselves never have gone through it. So no matter what level you teach at, consider video blogging as something either you, the teacher, can do or the students can do as a way to um, create PR for what's going on in the class and share out the good news. So some more things about the Videolicious app. Uh, this is going to link it here, direct link to the, the website. It will be listed as a free app, both iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch available. They did hit the 3 million download mark, which is pretty remarkable for an app. Um, it does tend to hit a lot of the top 10 lists when it comes to rapid video production, things that you can make you know, professional looking video without taking a lot of time. So it is completely free. There is no paid version for it, unless you're doing the enterprise level, which I talked about before. Um, that I have a link here to it. The paid enterprise edition is more, as I said, more for corporate markets. It's not so much for K-12, but you could. They, they gave me an account and let me play around with it. Um, let's see if they have a shot of the, yes, of here. You get a, a nice dashboard view of all the different projects that are in the works. So as students are using the app and creating things, they don't have to remember to like share it to the teacher. It's just automatic, just by logging into their account. I created all the accounts. I told the kids, log in with this username and password. And just by doing that, it then saves all finished projects to my main dashboard, if you will. Question? Uh, yes, do any schools in the area have the enterprise? Not that I know of. No, I was testing it out probably two years ago. And we were the only ones that I knew of. And that, he's really, um, the guy's name is Matt Singer that, that's behind the app. He's really not marketing it towards K-12. I was just kind of the example to see if there was a market there. But I think they're charging like you know, 1300 1500 bucks a year or something like that. That might be kind of tough for schools to do. Um, and maybe they'll get into this, but is 
screen? No, not with this. No, I have other apps that I like for green screen that we use, um, but this one no doesn't have green screen capability. Yeah. So the paid features are all in this link if you were interested in looking at that. And real estate really is a big part too because people are real estate agents find this is a great tool to narrate over a bunch of pictures or video clips and make you know quick little uh, videos of listings so that that tends to be a big market for this app as well so the limitations we have is we're limited to 10 shots now what they mean by shots is any photo and or video clip that's on your camera roll so all the content comes directly from your camera roll um, so 10 shots maximum and the overall length maximum of 60 seconds. And that first sounds like limiting because it's only 60 seconds, but it's actually a good thing. When you have students make something that's 60 seconds or less, they really have to decide what are the really important shots, what do, what's the story I have to tell, and not just ramble on for a while. And because we were using this in our live morning show, which you know was 7 to 10 minutes long, we couldn't just show a 5-minute video clip. It had to be a quick hitter. So most kids could really fit their videos between 30 to 45 seconds long and tell the story of whatever they were trying to advertise or promote or whatever the case was for their commercials. All uh, right, then we have see specific frequently asked questions about the app. This is going to take you to those things like if you're just starting out with the app, like do I need an account? How do I reset a password? How long can my video be? These are just great things to look at if you are a new user, and you can share this list as well with your students. Um, when I first got into Videolicious, I, the typical route is I learned the app myself very well, but this was a unique case. I knew of Videolicious, but I didn't have time to look at it, and I just rolled it out to the kids on a, on a Monday or a Tuesday, and by Wednesday or Thursday, they were you know, experts in making video projects. So I really didn't have to do direct teaching of this is how the app works, this is how you make things. They were able to look at the frequently asked questions, look at the demo videos that are included on their site here, um, and figure it out. And I think that's the beauty of it is it's very, there's not much to figure out. It's very straightforward. It's a, a wizard-like fashion that takes you through it step by step. Um, they have what they call video recipes. If you're looking for, if you're um, a teacher, not necessarily a technology teacher or an English teacher, but maybe you're history or social studies or Spanish, and you might think, how can I bring video into my classroom? Their video recipes are a great way to share. So here's a creating a video about science, and it shows. I think this is a nice one to look at. Let me see if I can get that one to play. When you're making a video about an educational science toy, in our case, one that teaches you about electric circuits, start by collecting supporting shots. Get video of children playing with a toy. We got shots of this girl making music with Play-Doh keys hooked up to a circuit board. Make sure you get close-up shots of their hands at play. I held my phone close to show her hands on the keys. You'll want to capture their reaction to the toys as well. We filmed these boys pointing to the toy and talking with each other. Get as many different types of shots as possible. If your toy has different applications like ours did, film each one of them. We got a faraway shot of this child playing on a tin foil mat, and close-ups of another one dipping her finger into water. Since our toy was musical, we made sure to get a few extra shots to use as natural sound bites. Now collect three separate interviews. You'll want to talk with the child, a salesperson, and someone who endorses the toy. Ask the salesperson to describe how the toy works and how it's educational. How does it help kids teach themselves? Is it safe to use? Ask the endorser if they use the toy and why they're a fan. Record each answer as a separate soundbite. Now decide which sound bites you want to use. Try to end with a bite that shows why the toy is educational and fun. To put it together, open Videolicious. Select your supporting shots in step one in the order that matches your sound bites. In step two, import your sound bites in the order you want them to play. Play back your sound bites and tap your supporting shots to follow them. We're here in the Gansmore Plaza at the Google Geek Street Fair testing out the Makey Makey. It's a circuit board that um, connects any computer program to everyday objects. A little bit of Play-Doh, uh, some tin foil, water and food coloring, and basically um, having kids connect the, connect the circuit through their own bodies and um, playing the piano. <laughs> By grounding yourself and then touching everyday objects, you're letting electricity run through your body 
and you're playing a circuit board which um, which basically thinks that it's part of the computer. The electrical current is negligible. Um, basically, it's safe for everybody. I love their Makey Makey product. Uh, if you were to go inside Google New York, you would actually see that we use it as well. So it's it's a lot of fun. I'm missing school, which is a big plus, so I'm happy about that. Kids basically teach themselves um, how to put together music through electrical circuits or you know the, the physical properties of electricity. We want technology to be enticing and fun and interactive, and they're doing it really well. Let's check it out. We're here in the Gansmore Plaza at the Google Geek Street Fair testing out the Makey Makey. It's a circuit board that um, connects any computer program to everyday objects. If you saw, she was tapping the bottom right-hand corner. That was her selecting which shots to be seen as B-roll footage like this over the person talking. So I'm, I'll demonstrate that too as we uh, make a sample one here. But that goes to show you how quick and easy it is to use a tool, but what takes the most amount of time is figuring out what's the story that I want to tell. Like which shots should I get? And I like how she brought in the whole idea, uh, I have it up here, about wide, medium, and tight shots. So if I was filming uh, what's happening in this room right now, I'd want to get a couple of wide shots to show that there's an audience you know, seated in rows. I would want to get probably some medium shots of maybe two or three people sitting close by talking to one another. And then I want to get some tight shots of even like a hand on a mouse or someone writing on a sheet of paper. Because those three different modes are what you switch between as a visual storyteller to help the audience understand what's going on without having to say any words about it. Just like when you watch a TV show, if you always notice in the beginning of the episode, you always see an outside of a building or a house or a street. That's called the establishing shot. It lets you know within seconds, all right, this is the scene, this is where it's taking place. And nothing even has to be said at that point. It's just the viewer sees that and they understand, okay, so I'm in a country environment or an urban environment or whatever the case may be. Um, so that having an, a, a thinking like a storyteller like that and collecting your shots is very important. When I would send the students out to collect their footage for their uh, what we called Life at Amherst Middle projects, it was a video you would watch and you would go walk away thinking, wow, I know what life is like at Amherst Middle. Those are the teachers, those are the students, this is what the gym looks like, this is what a, a locker looks like, you know, just telling the story that way. They'd have to collect their shots, at least 20 different shots, and they'd have to have a good mix of wide, medium, and tight shots. So they would come up with a shot list first before I let them leave the classroom to make sure I knew that there was purpose and they weren't just going to wander the halls for the period. And then um, they would go out and get their footage and always shoot it landscape the wide way, which is really important to shoot it this way, not the tall way because it doesn't fit a TV screen. Um, plenty of kids would come back with a tall way and say, oh, go back out, shoot that footage again. But they'd shoot it all the wide way, photos and or video clips, and then they'd be able to put their video together, usually within a class period or two. So that worked out well to be able to get um, what we called the Life in Amherst Middle Project and get a nice variety of shots. We then used those as the opening segment and sometimes even the closing segment of our live daily morning shows. So it kind of served a purpose as like the bookends for the, the live shows. And so I believe I have a lesson plan sample for that, the Digital Storytelling Project. So this is one here from Ben. Um, instead of a... Uh, like a final exam at the end of the semester. Hi guys, this is what Ryan I had the kids do was pick all semester long which project they felt had the most value to them. And Ben really liked the audio podcasting project. So he used Videolicious as the tool to put together his story. Hi guys, this is Ben. Hi guys, this is Ben. And today I'm going to read you a story about recording a podcast. Here are all the kids' creative, Here are all the kids creative wonderful projects in this room. In particular, in particular, here is Duncan. He is reading the directions to record a podcast. Here he is. He's on step seven. This is the step of recording a podcast. Here they are walking. Here they are walking into a quiet room to film their podcast. If it wasn't quiet, if it wasn't quiet, they would hear many noises from the outside world. Here they are pressing a button. Here they are pressing a button, and here they are filming their podcast. They're laughing, talking, having a good time. Here they are, walking to try to to Mr. G's desk to see if they can get Mr. G's approval. Oh, looks like Mr. G doesn't like it too much. Oh, poor boys. Oh, poor boys. Well, better look next time. That's my podcast. That's my podcast. So a lot of that, of course, was staged, but they 
as visual storytellers figured out what would you know what were the steps that we followed what would make it a little bit more humorous and the viewers would probably know it wasn't real like they weren't crying in their hands there but you know what pieces could we add to make it more interesting so a lot of critical thinking there goes into place about what would it be like for someone else to perceive what it is I'm trying to tell and I like having that kids being in someone else's mindset like what's the viewer gonna think rather than you know what what I think would be the cool thing to put in there um, the music you've been hearing is the built-in royalty-free music that comes with the app. I believe there's like nine or ten different tracks that are built into it, but you could use your own music, copyrighted music, from iTunes. The only problem is then if you put it somewhere like on YouTube, it gets flagged and probably YouTube won't play it. So our two workarounds we had, one is if we knew it was going up on the morning show, which ended up on YouTube, they had to use the copyright-free music in there. We also bought our own collection of copyright-free music, and then I put it on the iOS devices. There's like 500 different songs they could use that were all instrumental songs, but it's, it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't red flag it as copyrighted content. The other thing was, if we did have something that they wanted a specific, you know, Taylor Swift song that just had to be in there, I would let them make it, but then we wouldn't use it on the morning show, and instead we would store it on Google Drive, our, our school's Google Drive accounts, because then it's not out for the public to consume, and it's not going to get red flagged with copyright issues. You could mark it public for the world to view and then give the link out to people, you know, then anybody could see it. But it's treated differently in terms of how Google allows it to be red flagged or not red flagged. So I'm not saying we're getting around doing it legally, you're still using copyrighted music, but the bottom line was we're doing it for educational purposes. So even if the kids did get called on the carpet, some judge somewhere is not likely going to charge them, you know, money because they infringed on copyright because the purpose was purely educational. I tell the kids all the time, though, if we were going to make like a, a training tutorial on how to do this stuff, and we sell that training tutorial, we could do that. But then if we start using that Taylor Swift song in there, now we're profiting off of someone else's work, and that's not right. So they saw it that way from the point of view of if you were trying to teach someone and charge them for your book or your DVD or whatever you're selling, that's fine. But you can't use somebody else's work in it. So I think it, that worked out well, and at the end they were able to understand that and kind of respect that too because I myself, for many years, uh, with Adobe Visual Communicator, I produced green screen training DVDs, and I showed them that. And then I said I had to be very careful of all the footage I use as example footage in there. No logos, no Pepsi can in the corner of the desk, nothing, because then I'd be profiting off of someone else's work. So that, I think, made it real for them, and when they had the choice to pick copyrighted music or not, they tend to say, well, I'm, I'm going to go with the safe route, and I'll just pick something from the library of, of stuff that we have. So I kind of thought kids are just going to say, nope, I want that music I recognize, but that's not always the case. If they understand that there's um, other options out there and that their video lives on and there's a chance it may be used somewhere someday, make it so that it can be used for a, you know, a, a training DVD or some for-profit thing down the road. Because all the stuff they make and they store in their Google Drives, they can take with them after they leave 12th grade. They can download all the contents of their Google Drive and have that uh, for like a permanent portfolio. Now, a lot of that was video projects that they've created with Videolicious and other apps. All right, I have a lesson plan idea of how I, mainly my reason for showing you this is the format of how I would do my lesson plans. I would take a Google Doc and I would make a table, two columns in the table. On the left-hand side is a place for me to put the links, which would lead you to the video. So, for example, step one is about learning about video sequencing as a digital storyteller. In this case, it's taking you to a video that I had stored in, our, in my Google Drive account at school. Sometimes, though, it would take you to a YouTube video. Yeah, like I like this one. This guy here comes up with uh, very good digital storytelling techniques. Paragraphs. And, uh, Compelling video. So that one is in my Google Drive. But then other times, like the second video here, this one's taking you to SchoolTube, which is Ben's video we saw a little bit ago. And then when you get to step five, you're actually looking at a screencast I made that's taking you through step by step on how to use the app. So my lesson plans would be a lot of times watch a video and then do the steps. If okay, so I have a blank Google Doc open. Rewind. Like this one here was about making their shot list over about the those wide, medium, and tight shoulder shots. So if they've never used Google Docs before, they might not know using, how to create a brand new Google Doc. Uh, they watch see. the video, and then I narrate Adobe through it. I just don't have to sound up. Um, and then they, they learn, okay, so that's how I create my shot list. They go ahead and make it, and then they move on to the next step. So it was very self-paced, where not everybody was working at the same step, but they all had to meet the deadline. So... They probably had two or three weeks to work on all the different steps. Some kids got there early, and they had the chance then to make another video. Some kids took the entire time just to make the one video. So that way we allowed for um, different pacings to work within the different groups of students. So that's my lesson plan format. Two columns, 
if you are familiar enough with the app and using iOS devices, you might not have to watch the videos. But for those kids that were like, what's a Google Doc and how do I make one? Then they would click on the link to, uh, to watch the video play. And real nicely here too, if something needed to be changed in the fly, I could just right click on it and say, insert a new row and I could put in a new step. So I usually had those kids that would like work really fast ahead and I called those my beta testers. They would like say, oh, Mr. Z, did you realize that your video talks about a blue button and there's no more blue button on the app? And I go, oh, that's right, they changed the app. I gotta re-record that video. So I would re-record the screencast and then a day later I would just update it here. Because this is a living Google Doc, nobody's printing it out. The kids that were above that, they don't even realize that I've been making changes just steps ahead of them. So having a living Google Doc as your worksheet, if you will, um, really saved me a lot because then I wouldn't have to reprint things out again or change links up again. Everything would just be in this living doc that they would pull up. So that's my format of a uh, lesson plan that I would use for these kinds of projects. Some tips on capturing footage. We did talk about this already, the, the wide, medium, and tight. Rule of thirds. Is anyone familiar with the rule of thirds when it comes to shooting video? All right, we're going to take a look at this one then because I like this explanation. You don't always, the bottom line is when you're filming something, you don't always want to put the subject in the smack dab middle of the screen. A real professional knows about the lines for the rule of thirds, which is like a tic-tac-toe pattern. So let's see if we can do this. It's a town where most every visitor comes with a plan, a system, a mathematical rule. So what better place to talk about the rule of thirds than here in Las Vegas? The rule of thirds is a great thing to learn. It's the foundation for well-balanced and interesting shots. Sure, it's a formula, but with practice, you may find it's a good starting point. The rule of thirds actually goes way back. Artists have been using it for a few thousand years, at least since the Greeks who discovered it. So what exactly is the rule of thirds? Imagine your screen is divided into thirds horizontally and vertically, kind of like tic-tac-toe. Where these imaginary lines cross suggests four options for placing your shot center of interest. The rule is simple to implement. Pick an intersection and put the center of your subject there. Why do you need this rule? Well, you might be able to manage to ignore bad composition with half empty space in your frame, but nobody else will. Too many folks only look at the middle of the frame when they shoot. They're so focused on the subject, they just plop it down into the middle of the frame. It's a recipe for boredom. Using the rule of thirds helps produce video that is tight and well composed. So how do you use this rule? Well, here's an example. If you frame this shot with the top of the bridge in the center, you have a cluttered and confusing shot. Is the viewer supposed to look at the bridge? If so, then what's this empty road on the right? By filling the frame by zooming in a little and moving the camera to the left to cut out the road, you've not only created a more interesting shot, you've told the viewer what you want them to look at in your composition. The rule of thirds isn't really a rule at all, more like guidelines really. It's there to help you when you're trying to figure out how to frame a shot. When learning the rule of thirds, the most important questions are one, what's the main point of interest, and two, where am I putting it? So why does it work? Well, studies have shown that when folks watch footage, their eyes naturally go to one of these intersections. Using this rule works with the way we see images. Remember, sticking to the rules can stifle your creativity. Knowing when to follow a rule is just as important as knowing when not to follow a rule. When you compose your shot using the rule of thirds, you can decide whether it's your point of departure or your destination. It's up to you to decide how you're going to tell your story. So the rule of thirds is like a tic-tac-toe pattern. And if you ever watch, especially the, the news, you will see the newscasters always, their eye line is at the top line. Whether they're zoomed out far or zoomed up close, it's always going to be the eyeballs are right where you naturally would look, so that's where the top line of the third is. The bottom line for the third is, the rule is you put nothing below that, because that's where maybe a logo would show up, or an introduction title, or some sort of banner at the bottom. So your bottom third is always for graphics. So if you think that way when you're composing your shots, it tends to make them look more professional. So if you've got a group of kids, rather than centering them, you will go slightly off-center so you can see what's kind of in the background too, and they're uh, 
it kind of creates more visual interest. So that's our rule of thirds shot. And as I mentioned, this one's very important. Always shoot video and pictures in landscape wide only. You could bring something into video delicious that's shot in portrait, but what happens then is it puts the black bars on the edges. And because video delicious applies its own slow pans, that ends up having to zoom in even further. So it takes a shot that normally might be crisp, it makes it kind of blurry because it zooms in to compensate for the movement of it. So try to remember to always shoot in landscape and then you never have to deal with that blurriness or the black line issue. All right, some handheld mic options. The one that is my favorite, which is this one right here, is the iRig mic. Now there are a lot of mics on the market nowadays that plug in with the lightning connection. All right, this is not the headphone jack style. This is actually the, the uh, lightning connection that goes into the bottom charging port of your phone. That means it's a purely digital mic. So the mic itself is doing the work of converting it from analog, which is us speaking, into a digital format. The, the device is not responsible for making that conversion. So it tends to be much more cleaner, less static. If this jack moves a little bit, there's no static sound. Unlike here, when this one, the headphone jack, you could hear when I had it, you know, when it's partially plugged in, you get those kind of noises. That happens when you have the cheaper style mic, which in my list is the second and third one there, the $59 and the $39 mic. Those are analog mics that have that style connection that plug into your headphone port. They work, but they are more chance of introducing uh, noise into it. So I like the digital version, which uh, is the newest of the three. The price on Amazon right now is $99. I've seen it as high as $129 and as low as $79. So for some reason, the price does fluctuate. But what makes it so great is you could take the, this adapter off and it comes with a traditional USB style adapter as well. So I could now use it with my laptop or my desktop computer. So it's a typical USB mic or switch the cable and now it's an Apple style lightning uh, type. So it's, it's versatile in that sense. And I've used it for recording screencasts. I put this on a mic stand right here, hook it up to the laptop and now I got a really good mic to record uh, to the traditional format. But switch the cable and now it plugs into an iOS device. The other thing it has that makes it unique is a three-color LED on the front. When you first plug it in, it lights up blue to let you know that it is powered. Then, as you talk, it turns, with every word you say, it turns um, green. Green is good. That means the levels are good. But if you're talking too close or if the mic setting is too high, it'll turn red, and that lets you know it's distorting. So it would look like, uh, if you saw a waveform, it would look like you know, really big bars there, and it would sound very distorted and out of whack. So you have the ability to adjust from 0 to 100 on a rotary dial in the front here, which I teach students to do some mic checks, you know, test your mic as you're talking, watch the light, and then move the sensitivity of that mic. If it's a noisy classroom with a lot of students talking, you're going to really bring that level down, and you're going to have that mic right almost touching your lips as you're talking. Works really well. It could be in a very noisy, I've been in conference halls, exhibit halls, lots of noise, still picks up the person talking very nicely. Opposite of that, Sometimes you're doing green screen projects, and the students have to be like six, seven feet away. And we don't want to see this mic that they're holding. So we'll crank up the sensitivity very high, making sure we're in a quiet room. And then we can hold it low off camera so you don't see it, but it is directional. So wherever it's pointing to is where it's going to pick up. So we'll hold it low like this off camera, and it'll pick up them talking over there much nicer than the built-in mic would on the device itself. Because the built-in mics on iPads or iPhones are unidirectional. Or is it omnidirectional? Omnidirectional. Omni means many. So it's everywhere around this way and this way. So like going out around 10 feet or so all the way around me in a 360 degree is what it picks up. And you don't want that when you're shooting somebody that's standing over there. You don't want sound coming behind you to be picked up. So that's why I, I see if you're more than an arm's length away, that's kind of the gauge, more than an arm's length away, you want to have an external mic. And this one here is a, a nice option for that. But if you're buying a whole bunch of them and you don't have the 100 bucks each, at least you have other options there where you could buy the, uh, the iRig mic analog. It has three high, medium, and low settings for 59 bucks, Or the single level, which comes in like many different colors. I think this is really for karaoke. That's why they came out with this because there's a, there's a show on colors there. Oh, I just got the blue link. But there are other colors there that you can purchase. Um, and it's designed to be the lowest entry cost uh, for a handheld mic. So those are some Amazon options there. Uh, they sell them at other places, but Amazon tends to be very competitive with the pricing on them. So now that brings us to some app demonstrations. I'm going to show you kind of three different levels here. Um, level one would be the basic. We're going to just put together photos 
and maybe even video clips together with no, no camera used at all and no microphone narration at all. So just a very basic level. And I want to show you all three of these so I can show you how it, um, how it gets better as you go upwards. So here's the live shot of my iPad that we're running here. And by the way, does everyone know how to do this so you're wired and you don't have to rely on Wi-Fi? Because this is kind of a side note. I should mention this here. I, I, I have an app called Reflector that I like to use so that I can wander around the room wirelessly and this talks to my laptop wirelessly and it, it's good because you can walk around and not be tethered with a cable. The downside of that is it really, really relies on your Wi-Fi to be very reliable. And in an environment like this where there's lots of people on the Wi-Fi, I tried it before you guys came in, it was just dropping. It wasn't staying consistent. And I, I can't really have that in a presentation like this where time is essential. So I did the hardwired method, and this only works now if you have a Mac. It doesn't work if you have Windows. You've got to have a MacBook running the latest operating system. And then, well, it used to be, I used to have to say you've got to have at least iOS 8.0, but now we're at the iOS 9. So as long as you have the latest operating system on your iOS device and on your Mac device, laptop or desktop, um, you would use the, I'll go away from full screen here, you'd use QuickTime Player. QuickTime Player comes automatically on the operating system. You don't have to install it. And then you go up to, it's kind of a hack, you go to File, New Movie Recording. Even though I'm not recording a movie, you go to New Movie Recording. That launches a window like this, like you see here. And of your options, one of those options is going to say the name of your iOS device. I've done this with my iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad. And therefore, you can be hardwired and have you know, reliability. I have to rely on the Wi-Fi. And you can do things that you wouldn't be able to do if I was using reflectors. So I could like go into the settings area. If I was doing a demonstration on how to connect with Wi-Fi, you know, I can switch to different Wi-Fi networks and show how that's all done. And I couldn't do that if I was using Air Server or Reflector. Does anybody use Air Server or Reflector? Those are the two well-known ones for schools that have iPads especially. So those are, those are wireless options. But as I said, you really got to rely on the Wi-Fi being very robust in order to have it work all 100% of the time. So for safety's sake, I'm hardwired here, so we don't have to worry about losing connection and stuff. All right, so Videolicious, I'm going to launch. It's the bottom one with the black and uh, diamonds on them there. <coughs> and I'll go back to the most beginning step. So step one, as it says here, is select the videos and photos you would like to include in your movie. So up in the upper right-hand corner, if I wanted to log in with my free account, I could do that. The advantages would be then that it would save my videos to my cloud account. So I could go to videolicious.com and I could get them there. But I'm not really needing that right now. I'm just going to save everything locally on the device itself. So what I will do is go to the bottom center where it says choose shots. It lets me go to my camera roll. And all of my video and photo clips are there. So to give you a little hint here for best results, use horizontal videos. And you can trim inside of clips if you have a, a video clip. So the story that I will tell today will be uh, last week I went with the Oakfield Spanish Club to Toronto and we did a Spanish cultural immersion trip where we did, uh, they did a dancing thing. We went to Casa Loma, which was really neat to see. Um, what else? We got a tour, went to the Hockey Hall of Fame. So we had a variety of different things throughout that day. So I took some photographs. I don't think I have any video clips though, but that's okay. Um, I can still show you how you add photos. So. Um, I will just tap. See, the first one I tapped has a one on it, so that'll be the first one that shows up. That's the second one, third one, fourth one, fifth one. I can go up to ten. I'll just end it at six total. All right, so that step one is now complete. I've chosen my shots. If I needed to edit any of those, I probably should show that. Bottom center there where it says edit, I'll tap on edit. And let's say um, this shot here the one uh, number six shot I chose this is a wide shot. Maybe I want to get just the center uh, and I don't need to have all the kids included. So I can use my fingers to zoom in and I can go like a closer shot and I can move it around the way I need it to be. And then I'll hit save. So now that shot has been edited, not permanently edited. It didn't destroy the picture at all. It's just inside this app only that picture will get used in that fashion. And notice there's a little icon on that to let me know that there's some sort of editing that took place on that. All right, so now I'm happy. I'll move on to the next step. Now, in this case, I said in my basic video, I'm not going to use the camera and do any narration. I'm not even going to talk. So I don't really need to do step two, which is to film yourself and talk about it. So I will hit in the upper right-hand corner, skip. And this is where I now choose one song to enhance my movie. So bottom center, it says choose music. 
that comes up with, okay, those other ones are on my iPhone, that's why, um, the theme music, nine of them there I can choose from. And see there, the ones that I can't choose have a little padlock next to them, so it's only the top of my list there uh, that I get to choose. So you can preview them, I believe, let's see if it works. It may not work because of the way I'm projecting here to the computer. I put my volume up there, volume up there. This is usually a problem when it, whatever you demonstrate, yeah, because I'm hardwired like this, the audio would be only if I had headphones plugged in. But music would be playing there, and I could say, sure, I want to go with that one. It now creates a preview, and when I hit play, it'll show the slow, the music is actually playing, the slow pan and zooms. There's really no rhyme or reason what it's panning or zooming. It's not looking for faces necessarily, but it'll go through the pictures and put a little bit of you know, motion on them to make it visually interesting. The music is playing, and then at the end, the music will fade out, and the picture will fade out to black as well. So that's a basic level. If I just you know, typically, like, you know, on the car ride home, if I wanted to just throw together a bunch of photos and videos and not have to use, like with iMovie, drag each one on the timeline and then sync them all up, but you can do that, but it takes time. This way, I just go boom, 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 select them all, step three, add music, and step four, I'm done. You know, it's a quick way of putting together something, which then now I could share by hitting save. It gives me the ability to share out on social media. So if I connected any of those accounts, I could do that. But by default, it always will save automatically to your camera roll. So you don't have to worry about, um, you know, having to share to a, a social media place. It'll just save it if I don't choose anything like that. It'll process it and it'll drop it right on the camera roll. And this is a short one. It doesn't have much. So you can see it goes pretty quick. And now it lives on the camera roll. If I go to that here, is the very last one there, 25 second long clip. So you see that whole process I find goes very quickly. When I come back from an event and I have lots of photos and videos and I don't want to narrate, I do that, what I just did there. I just tap them all, select music, and you're done. It's a, it's a quick way to assemble everything together. In fact, I'm surprised iMovie doesn't have anything that simple as well. Where you could just uh, pick a bunch in your camera roll and say, blend them all together. I don't care about, um, you know, where the transitions are happening, just transition them all with a nice fade between, and it does it for you automatically. So that's a step one. The step two, which I had on my list here, which I call the intermediate level, is you have a little bit of narrated storytelling. We're going to do microphone only. Let's pretend that I am camera shy and I don't want to be seen in the video, but I want to give a little narration so I can tell the viewers what they're seeing. So I'll do one of those examples now. Back to here. And upper right-hand corner, I say new video. And we're back to step one. So step one, we will choose those shots once again. And I'll maybe pick some different ones from last time. All right, there, I chose six of them. Again, I could choose up to 10. Now I will go to upper right-hand corner, save. Step two is to film myself and talk about the music photos in your movie. In the, let me see where it says now, the bottom center, it says tell your story. You're gonna go there and it's gonna load the camera. At this point, people are thinking, uh oh, I didn't want to be seen on camera. You don't have to be. Up in the upper right hand corner are those symbols up there. If you press, it's hard, I guess it's a camera plus a mic. If I touch that, now it's just a mic. So, mic only, it's going to only capture my voice and not what, I, what I, you're seeing here. Um, in the bottom left hand corner, notice that red record button. It has the green symbol around it for the mic. Now, as I talk closer, you can see it gets louder, and it's probably too, too loud. But as I bring it further away, it's not as loud. So that's a nice visual way of seeing if your levels are too high. And if you don't say anything, see there's a little bit of room noise or, or buzzing of the fan or you know things like that. You can see that's moving on there. So that's a gauge where you can see if you need to move yourself to a more quiet location. I would have the students do that if they noticed it was more than a quarter of the way up. Um, so that's what we do for that. And then my clips are here on the right-hand side ready to go, ready for me to tap on them. So I will tap them as I, as I see what's coming up next. And you, I guess seeing it will make more sense. So here we go. Nice little countdown. Hi, everybody. Let's take a tour of our Toronto trip from this week. First here, you're looking at the salsa dancing lessons that the, uh, they were demonstrating up on stage, and the students were doing that. And this next shot here is showing some houses that were over 125 years old, which is really uh, interesting, and they go for a very high value still. This next shot is the Hockey Hall of Fame, and those are all hockey pucks you're looking at. Apparently, when a team comes out, they dedicate one of their uh, hockey pucks, so there are lots of them to look at. 
And in the morning, this is a shot of the bus. It was a very nice bus we rode on. And then as we crossed over the bridge, you could see fog and, or mist or something like that over the Lewiston Bridge to Canada. And finally, here's a shot in the conservatory hall where right behind there's, uh, you can see there's people getting their wedding photos taken when we were there. So I hope you enjoyed this tour and have a nice day. All right, now unfortunately, I can't let you hear the audio because of the, the way this is working here. I don't think I can because where that's, uh, you know what though, there might be one more thing I could do. The microphone, if I choose that, I don't know if that's going to mess it up though. Nah, it's not going to work. Okay. Well, my voice is talking here, and um, you're hearing me go through the recording that I just did there. And so now it is a narrated tour with the photos like you're seeing there. Um, we haven't chosen music yet, so if I say I'm happy with that, I hit save in the corner. If I'm not happy with it, I hit delete, and I simply re-record over again. So I'll say I'm happy with that, I'll hit save. And this is step three where you choose your music. So I'll choose one of the music they have there. Now this is actually a neat feature that I asked for back when it was Videolicious 1.0, and now they're at version 3.0. I said to Matt, the designer, I said, wouldn't it be nice if there was some sort of adjustment because some students talk really quiet and some talk really loud. And we want to be able to find the happy medium between too much music or too little music, too much voice, too little voice. So how about some sort of a slider? So he did built it in. So you could go this way is more music, less narration. And this way is more narration, less music. So you find the happy medium based on what you're hearing and then save it. And then it blends them together accordingly. Now, whenever there was a, I was just using photographs, but if I had a video clip that had its own sound in it, it would take the music and duck it down low, and then when the video clip was over, it would bring it back up again. So it does that, what's known as rubber banding on an audio timeline. It does that intelligently in case you choose a video clip and you want that natural sound of the video clip to be in there. So I would play it, it would have the music, it would have my narration, and if I'm happy with it, I hit save. And again, we get to decide, if you're logged in, you can save to the... Uh, HD, the higher higher quality mode, but if not, I believe it is 360p video instead of 720p high def video. So I hit save, it would uh, save it to my social media and or to the camera roll, and then I'll just cancel it because we don't, don't have to wait through it. So that process I walked you through there was our um, what we would call a level two video, which would be narrated storytelling with the mic only but no camera. So now the biggest of them all, which is really the purpose of the app is to do a newscaster style where you're having the built-in camera, the front-facing selfie camera, and the microphone all working together for one, uh, one nice compiled video. So let's go back to here. Go back to the very beginning. All right, so here we are, step one. Step one, we choose our shots. And we go to the camera roll. I'll pick a couple shots. In fact, even I'll pick that video clip that's at the end there too, the, the one that we made earlier. So now there'll be some motion in there. Then I will go to save. Step two, tell my story. It loads up the camera. This is where it gets a little tricky. You sometimes want to have a camera person so that you're not the one holding it, but sometimes you're a one-person show and you have to do it all by yourself. I have a little stand that I have on my desk so I can put it in like that. And then you got to look at the right, the lens of the camera is that little dot there. If you're looking at yourself, like I am here, you're off camera and it looks kind of odd when the viewers are watching it. So you got to always make sure you're looking at the lens of the camera right there. And having it in some sort of a stand is good too. So maybe I can fake it by going like this. All right, put yourself centered in the camera roughly. And here we go. Hi everybody, it's Mr. Z here with some photos from our Toronto trip. So let's begin taking a tour. These are the seniors on the trip and they wanted to get a picture in front of the CN Tower that you can see behind them. This next shot is houses that were over 125 years old, but you wouldn't imagine how much they were still selling for. It was quite astonishing. Next up here is our picture of our tour guide. She was taking us through the city tour. And a shot of Ikea on our way down the highway. I mostly got that for my wife, who's a big fan of Ikea, and texted it to her. And then lastly, here's some video footage that I wanted to put in as a sample to show you what this looks like when you're running this app. So back to me now on the big screen here. I thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoy going to Toronto someday as well. 
Now, did you see at the end when I switched back to myself, I just touched the big screen. And the big green box went around the overall screen. When I was doing the B-roll footage, it was only around the small images there. So you kind of have to keep your eyes out for the big green box because that lets you know what it's currently recording. So here's what it looks like. It starts out with the talking head shot like a, like a newscaster shot would be. And then it transitions to talking about the camera shot. And then a nice dissolve into the next one. What's good about photos is they're unlimited in length. I could have gone on and talked about that photo for you know 25 seconds or three seconds. It doesn't matter, it's a photo, so it automatically adjusts. But when you bring in video clips, there's a set duration of time there. So you have to make sure you can tell your little snippet within the time uh, of that video clip. And then all the slow transitions and such happen depending on how much, um, how much time is allotted there. So th this was the video clip that we showed at the end there. That's blending in. So now as it comes back to me with seven, six timelines up in the corner there, our time code. And the free version, of course, is going to have some branding at the end. Some people that don't like that, the trick is you bring it into iMovie and you chop off the end of it there. If, if, you know, if you wanted to get rid of the branding there. Another reason, too, you might want to bring it into iMovie is then you could throw in a different soundtrack or you could put in some lower third graphics, you know, things that you can't do inside of the app. So that's been a workflow for a lot of uh, users of the app, is make it in Videolicious, save it to the camera roll, and then go into iMovie. Pull it in iMovie and, and add on additional things. So if we had, if this was a two-hour workshop, like I normally teach, this would be the point where I would say get with your partner, come up with what you learned today in today's workshop or today's uh, conference, and then you'd make a video. So I've done this before. Um, at ISTE and other national conferences. And it's, it's a great thing to see people that go from, you know, just installing the app moments ago to producing video that's very impressive that they can send back to their principal or, you know, back to their students at school. So consider that in the next couple of days if you want to try using the Videolicious app as a new user. Now that you saw the three different levels of what you can do with it, um, create a little something with that app that then you can share out with anybody um, through social media or even through an email attachment. And that's what's good, too, about being under 60 seconds is they easily fit as an email attachment um, right from your um, iPhone or, or iOS device. So what questions do you have about anything you saw today? So, so when you did a live broadcast at your school, mm -hmm. what, what program did you use to do that? Let's, uh, for many, many years, it was Adobe Visual Communicator. In fact, Sue, did you use that before? Not really? Okay. Let me see if I can still, because of course I don't work at Amherst anymore, but I believe it's still online. Uh, we use Wirecast. And that's what I'm going to be bringing to Oakfield, where I teach now, or where I work as an administrator now, um, using Wirecast to be able to do green screen video production. So the very last show I've ever done was June 16th. It was right before I took the job. We'll show you what that show will look like. Now this was the Life at Amherst Middle opener. This was made with iMovie. Well, let's see, if I go to YouTube, I can go full screen. All right, so if you've ever used iMovie, have you used the, what do they call it, movie trailer feature? So this is the movie trailer idea, where it is templatized, and they have photo and video clips, stuff about the school. So this runs about a minute. I'll, I'll just jump ahead. And here's the beginning of the show. It's a fake control room. This is, a, this is made with a program called Ultra that doesn't even exist anymore. To give the illusion that we're in the studio, and then it'll dissolve into the green screen shot. Good morning, Amherst Middle School. This is Joseph and Ariana with today's live at 9 to 5 newscast, newscast for Tuesday. They're reading off a teleprompter. 2015. Today's regular schedule is 8 Please stand for today's pledge of the flag. Transitions to a pre recorded pledge segment. Same one every day. I pledge allegiance to the flag stand for spring. And then back to them again. And now for today's news. The library will be closed period 6 and 7th grade lunch. All books are due back in the library at this time. Book exchanges are over for you. Any students in the team? And then after this is a pre recorded caring message clip. These are many Good years morning, old. Amherst Middle School. This is Diana with today's caring message. Whatever comes my way, I can make the most of it. 
There, these are at least five years old. This is coming from Visual Communicator. Have a great day. And it would transition back to a live shot of the weather. And we borrowed the weather images from WIVB. This is all ad lib, so not off the teleprompter. It's going to be partly sunny until 74 and 78, and the winds are going to be west 8 to 15 miles per hour, now it's 74. And when she says that, we know to move on to, the, to this slide. It's going to be in the high 70s throughout the whole video. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more. And now we transition to another pre recorded clip. This was made with iMovie. We did ebook reviews of books available. And this was made with a green screen app on uh, iPads. The green screen by Do Inc. I'll just jump ahead here a little bit. And then a word of the week, another pre-canned project, pre-recorded. And then to our late-breaking unscripted news. Unscripted. A lot of sports announcements and stuff like that. Teachers will come on too. If you pre-order the book, you should have received it. In the and now what's next? And then it closes with another one of those Life at Amherst Middles. So that was the whole show. It was anywhere from 7 to 12 minutes long, depending on the, those unscripted portions. Um, but we made that with Wirecast. And if, to help you with that, I've taught uh, two-hour workshops on Wirecast that you can watch uh, from, I think it was NiceGate last year. So if you go to my blog and you go to workshops and presentations, you will be able to see, there it is right there, NiceGate 2015, so last year at NiceGate. I recorded it so you could watch. I go through everything, all the equipment that we used, um, how to use Wirecast, and all that. So if you're interested in that. And then I also have on my blog, um, we, a case study was done about us. Let's see, I just searched it by my blog name. Um, and then Wirecast, of course I spelled it wrong, but it should come up still, yeah. Put in robsytraining.com and then Wirecast. And then this was a case study that was done about us that breaks down again the types of uh, uh, hardware that we used for it. So the company uses this as a promotional piece to talk about how schools are using it. And then we got a nice little graphic here about what runs it. It's really it's this laptop right here that is a central piece of the show. Everything feeds into it, camera comes in, mics come in, and then out to YouTube Live, record locally to the hard drive, and then out to a TV preview monitor. So much different setup compared to what we had years ago with Visual Communicator. And Wirecast is still a very active product that's always being upgraded. So it's, uh, it's, it's the way to go, in my opinion, if you're doing live newscasts. I have a studio all built ready to go in Oakfield. We just don't have the equipment in yet, but that's something we're going to work on for September. Yep. Anything else about anything we talked about today? All right. Well, I thank you guys once again. And if you want to relive the stuff we just covered, because I, I know I go through really fast, um, plug in your email address right there, subscribe by email, and then anytime I make a blog post, including future workshops, I'll be at ISTE in Denver coming up in a couple of uh, months there. Um, nice Skates in the fall. FETC is in January. I present every year at these things, and I record them and put them up here so you can, just like that, you can play them and watch them just like what I recorded. What well, it has I'm to be logged now. in in order to do so feel free to subscribe at no cost and uh, keep yourself in the loop of tech tools that we're coming across and finding that are really cool. So thank you for coming, guys. Thank you.